Hello, good afternoon and welcome to this session we're about to have on the question of trade. It's great to be at the Oxford Real Farming Conference. It's always the great treat at the beginning of the year. And I want to say thank you very much to all of Delaghi at Sustain and indeed to all of Sustain, the Alliance for Better Food and Farming, who've really as an NGO done more than any other group in the UK to push the issues of food, of farming, of public health, both as policy and in the public eye. They are tremendously useful to me. Um, as a short introduction, my name is Rosie Boycott. I've been a journalist all my life. I was then the chair of the London Food Board, and I now sit in the House of Lords as a crossbench peer, and I specialise in all aspects of public health and food policy and a lot now on the intersection between the food system and climate change and I can tell you that uh, if, if you'd said trade to me a few years back I would have like many of you may do I'd have sort of yawned and I'd have thought that it had nothing really to do with me and that did it really matter very much but what I've found in since we left the European Union and that trade has become a thing and that it is one of those subjects that the more you learn about it the more you realize it is completely fundamental to our lives and in fact every time you buy something or you eat something that product has been traded in either straightforward or not so straightforward ways that has depended on agreements between countries, uh, some products the result of extreme fights between countries about what you will have, the standards. I mean, we have just been in the House of Lords on Tuesday debating um, the last parts of the trade bill, where a lot of which was about will we keep the same standards that we have in the EU on any trade negotiations we do in the future about food? Where will public health be represented in the trade bill? These are you think that these things were obvious, but in fact, they have to be hard fought. And I can say here now that I'm super grateful to Ola for all her help. Now, the format of today is very simple. We have three fantastic speakers, one joining us from Maine, one joining us from the Punjab, and Ola joining us from London. I am in Somerset, just for the record. Um, and they're each going to make a presentation about trade, how it affects uh, us in the UK, which will be all as part. And then Sharon, who is in Maine, is going to be talking more about the whole situation in America. And I suspect referring to the gobsmacking events that happened on Capitol Hill last night. And then we'll come to Devinda Sharma, who is in the Punjab and who will be able to update us as well on the farming riots that are going on in India. Because in fact, the story that that tells us is a very, very important part of the trade story. And again, one of those ones that unless someone lays it out for you, it's hard to see how it connects up to everything. So on, I will introduce them a bit more fully as we get to them. But to start with, um, let's, um, Orla, who is the head of public affairs at Sustain, for said the Alliance of Better Food and Farming. Orla is an absolute force for good in the food world. She used to work in Whitehall and then she also but Leon, she ran the campaign for effectively for the campaign to universal free school meals. And I think that's where Ola and I first met. So, Ola, over to you. And um, thank you very much. Thanks, Rosie. Um, so, first things first, thanks, Rosie. And thanks so much to Sharon and Devinda for joining us. Uh, we're really grateful for your time. Um, in the UK, we've been talking a lot about trade in the last four years, but mostly in the context of Brexit and exiting the EU. Um, but we need to start turning our minds really to emerging trade policy in the UK and how we can influence what is being built as we exit the EU. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and cover three areas and I'm going to try and give you some reasons to be cheerful as we go along, because I think we need it. It feels like a dark day. Um, dark couple of years. So um, my three topics are going to be last year's food standards campaign in the UK, uh, a bit on Brexit and some opportunities that you can have to influence in the near future. So first up, last year's food campaign that was linked to the agriculture bill that went through the Houses of Parliament. And we and our allies worked very hard to, to raise the issue of food standards. And that came out in polling with over 80% of people saying that they um, rejected the idea of being given lower um, food standards like chlorinated chicken, but also things 
products used with banned, sorry, produced using banned pesticides or the overuse of antibiotics. And the issue really cut through. And we saw that with the momentum building at the end of last year, where um, thanks to Jamie Oliver's team who were really involved, we got numbers collected, which showed that um, two and a half million people signed petitions on the issue and a quarter of a million people wrote to their MP. So huge amounts of engagement and real sign of movement building. And we want to make sure that we keep that momentum going. So unfortunately, MPs chose not to write the food standards into law, but thanks to all the noise that everybody made, including I'm sure a lot of people who've tuned in today, um, the government um, set up a trade and agriculture commission. And that was an idea that originated from the um, National Farmers Union. But at the time, Sustain said we weren't happy with it because it was temporary, it lacked teeth, and it was stacked with big agribusiness. So we weren't happy at all. But, you know, we kept advocating and lobbying and the government conceded again. And the TAC is now going to be statutory. It's going to be independent and it's going to have experts on plants, animals and the environment. So, you know, you can all take that as a win and then um, put some put some fire in your belly for what comes next. But we're a bit we're a bit still a bit concerned because it doesn't cover consumer concerns of public health. So um, thanks to Rosie last night in the House of Lords, more good news that we were able to get the trade bill amended in the Lords last night on food and animal welfare and environment standards um, and human rights. And also they have um, amended the bill to ask that the Trade and Agriculture Commission consider public health and health inequalities. So we're really delighted with that. And that allows us to continue the, the debate and the conversation with, uh, with policymakers here in the UK. So my second topic was Brexit, and don't don't feel disheartened. I know that it's been a very divisive issue, but um, you know the UK is building new policy, and we all need to try and stay engaged uh, with the process and pay attention. So what do we know about the Brexit deal? Well, it happened to Christmas Eve. Uh, it's twelve hundred pages of legal text, and it's essentially a blueprint to manage the future relationship. We know that it's created a border in the Irish Sea, so now that um, goods that move from um, Great Britain over to Northern Ireland will have to go through customs checks. And there's also going to be the same sort of paperwork headed the other way onto mainland Europe. Um, we know also that there's going to be lots of new structures like a partnership council. And we also know that there are checks and balances in the agreement, essentially, that allows the UK to diverge on regulation so it can make its own regulations. But if that starts to impact on the trade relationship or if it creates unfairness, then the EU could, there's a rebalancing. They could, for example, introduce tariffs. So the, the agreement does allow for that. But we also know that um, it, it can still be altered and also it's going to be renegotiated in five years. So we still need to keep an eye on it. So are there things to be cheerful about? Well, I know lots of people on the, on, who are here in the audience might well, might well have had some objections to the common agricultural policy um, and the, the, new, the new systems that the UK government are going to put in place may, might well um, give us an opportunity to tailor things better for the UK. And they're also, now that we've exited, it might be, there might be a bit of breathing space where we can have some sensible conversations about things that we may want to rejoin, like chemicals regulation reach or the environment agency and also we're not against trade itself as Rosie said we're trading all the time and it presents opportunities and there are opportunities for good sustaining trade we know that organics are in a rapidly growing market and we know that um, sustainable fish is is outselling non-sustainable so or at a faster rate sorry um, so there are opportunities there for really good trade in terms of policy making there's probably four things for you to know about. Um, one is the trade bill, which um, Rosie and I touched on, and that will be um, still in the Lords for now, but then coming back to the Commons. So there will be opportunities for you to get involved and write to your MP, for example. There's also free trade agreements. Um, and free trade agreements, there's a lot talked about WTO rules and you know what it does and doesn't allow. But actually, we can ask for whatever we like in a free trade agreement. We just have to get the other country to agree to it. So there are actually opportunities there to bake in high standards that benefit us and our trading partner nations. Um, and um, the TAC as well, the Trade and Agriculture Commission, the, um, the temporary TAC has a report coming in February. So we'll all be watching out for that. And also there'll be the appointments process to the new statutory TAC. And we'll want to keep an eye on that to make sure that that's got the broad representation that we want. And finally, there's the... Um, 
national food strategy and they're going to be talking about health and environment in the next couple of months so do keep an eye on what they're doing and engage with them whenever you can it's better to engage with them in advance than complain afterwards and they're doing a lot of work to reach out to people so i'm sure they would welcome um, any input that you had and a final plug before i wrap up and that is we've got a report coming in the next couple of weeks about the impact of trade on our diets and particularly child health so do please watch out for that and help us promote that I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Orla, thank you. That was an absolute tour de force of where we are. So many interesting things. We could wrap it on, but I'm going to wait until we've introduced all the speakers. And a good point to say to everybody, please post questions in the chat box. And we're going to do our best to come to as many as we can. And in fact, we will at three o'clock, we will jump over onto a Zoom link, which you've probably all got, and continue taking questions for another 15, 20 minutes if we don't get through them all together, which, uh, and looking again in the chat box, apparently we've got 4,000 people signed up from 80 different countries, so the chances are we're going to get a lot of questions, and so please post them, and we'll try and make sure we at least address the ones that are the most popular. So after all a sterling beginning, our next speaker is Sharon Troop, who is a senior attorney at the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. Sharon's been working on this policy for over a decade, focusing on international trade agreements and how they intersect with environmental and food and public health policies right up my street, as one might say. So Sharon is in Maine, and I know she's going to also refer, at least I think so, to the situation right now in Washington. So very big welcome here, Sharon. Um, over to you. Thank you so much, Rosie, Orla, and Devinder. It's great to be part of this uh, international presentation. You know, I, I was working on my presentation yesterday, and all of a sudden, um, I'm getting notices that the Capitol is being taken over by armed thugs and a mob. And, you know, one of the first things I was asked to address in my five minutes was, you know, what's the political situation and backdrop in the United States right now? And I was going to say, well, things are looking up. You know, we have these new uh, elections in Georgia that both went with the Democratic candidate uh, winning, which makes a big difference for Joe Biden to go forward with a progressive agenda because now the Senate will be controlled barely by Democrats, but they get to decide what bills get taken up. They will have a role in confirming his uh, mm -hmm. his cabinet. And um, that is really good news in terms of, you know, change on, on climate in particular, change on healthcare issues, and certainly the potential to do positive things on trade that are different from what came before. But then we have an armed takeover of, of the Capitol and, and literally in lockdown for many, many hours with the intent to disrupt actually the transfer of power with an intent to in fact reverse the election um, that gave it to, to Joe Biden and, and Kamala Harris. So this is a really fraught moment. I mean, uh, you know, we, we had senators and representatives um, hiding under their death so that they wouldn't be um, injured during this time. And, you know, they, they, Eventually, they got together uh, again. Um, people were expelled out of the Capitol, and um, by like 3:30 this morning, uh, the Congress had confirmed that um, we are going to pay Joe Biden and Kamala Harris as our president and vice president. But I mean, this is a scary time, and it makes you wonder, you know, whether we are so divided at this time in the United States that we can move forward um, with the kinds of positive change that that many of us are really hoping um, could come out of this new administration. You know, I think on the positive side of that, what I saw, many, many of those uh, legislators that were trying to challenge the election during this debate, uh, when they came back after hiding under their desks, uh, dropped those challenges. Many continued, but many just said, look, enough is enough, and maybe there will be a chance for some more bipartisanship um, as we go forward. Turning just to the trade uh, issue specifically, this does mean that Catherine Tai, who's been nominated by um, uh, uh, President-elect Biden to be the U.S. trade representative, the top official uh, in charge of trade policy and negotiating agreements, is likely to, to uh, be confirmed. Um, that won't necessarily mean a huge 
difference in how um, the U.S. Um, proceeds on trade policy. And I think that this is a moment in the United States where we can say we want something different. Uh, the U.S. has been negotiating a trade agreement with the UK. It has been talking about uh, entering into um, agreements with India, among other uh, countries out there. The UK agreement has been progressing over a period of a couple of years, and actually they've had multiple uh, five or six rounds of negotiations. It is not completely negotiated, despite what I've seen the ambassador, uh, <laughs> the UK ambassador saying, it is not completely negotiated. And there are huge issues, particularly around agriculture and food that are not resolved. Uh, but the question is, will the Biden administration want to continue with that um, or will they want to really start anew? What they have said publicly as well, well, we should have a moratorium uh, while we deal with the pandemic, while we deal with the fact that our economy has cra is crashing and burning. We, we are doing a horrible job of rolling out vaccinations in most parts of the United States. There is a lot to, to deal with. And now we have this, this sort of insurrection situation going on at the same time. It's hard to believe that in the first couple of months, uh, the Biden administration will leap into um, continuing that trade agreement, but it is certainly further along. And in some ways you could say it's not quote a new agreement. So that is something um, certainly to watch out for. Uh, one of the constraints that is on the Biden administration and it certainly links to the second topic I was supposed to touch on, which is parliamentary oversight. Um, under the, um, the Congress basically has a lot of authority over trade um, right from the get go. Um, and they have given up a lot of that authority under something called trade promotion authority, which allows for the executive or the president to go ahead and take charge of negotiations, conduct those negotiations, and then send it back to Congress when the negotiations are over with. And there's a procedure for um, Congress to vote either yes or no, uh, but not to amend it. But what we have found out is that in fact, if Congress has the power to say yes or no, they can also have the power to turn to the executive and say, we don't like a lot of things that are in this agreement and you need to go back to the drawing boards and change it. And that's exactly what they did quite recently under the new NAFTA and or the USMCA with Canada and Mexico, where they said, we don't like what you did on prescription drug policy, um, change that. We don't like what you did on labor, make it stronger. But one thing I would just say to you is that around food and ag, that is not something that I have seen Congress really raise up and say, well, we wanna do something different than we're doing now. And what is it that the US does now? It's very much promoting an export economy with commodity crops, industrialized agriculture, and export of many of the products that, of course, have been raised in uh, the British media and, and population of great concern to many people. Things that are, you know, grown with, um, you know, pesticides that are not allowed uh, in the EU, that um, are currently not allowed in the UK. Uh, products that are, um, you know, uh, not labeled the same way. Uh, we have antibiotics use that is uh, different from what um, you experience. Our meat packing industry is one that has been allowed to really uh, uh, treat workers horribly with these fast Lyme speeds and um, really dangerous conditions leading to um, COVID infections among other um, concerns. Um, animal welfare standards are, are really um, terrible in the United States um, with some changes coming at the state level. So this is the kind of agriculture that has been promoted by the trade agreements in the past. And the question now is, Will there be motivation and support for really changing that approach? And I have to say that the jury is mixed in my view on that because uh, Biden has, although appointing, uh, proposing to a new trade um, representative, who I think is very open to thinking about things in a different way, particularly around climate and labor issues, I don't know where she stands on food and ag issues, but the pressures are certainly there from, from big ag and corporate ag yeah. to continue along. And um, on the other side, his pick to head up the agriculture department is coming straight out of uh, a, a lobbying group uh, for big ag and indeed was the um, agriculture secretary under Obama, which pushed the Trans-Pacific Partnership and other agreements that um, really did not um, promote 
high standards in food and agriculture. So I think that we, you know, it remains to be seen what happens there. Just finally, um, is there room for co collaboration here? Absolutely. Orla and I, for example, um, work together to submit uh, evidence to the House of Lords on just what a trade deal with the US and the UK might mean for food standards and might mean for agricultural policies going forward. And I think that that's very important both in terms of showing that there's people in the US that care about these things, but also it helps us in the US to say, look, we could do an ag policy that's different from what we have right now, that is climate friendly, that supports local agriculture, that's sustainable, um, that, that provides support for agroecology and, and organic um, food um, uh, farms. You know, this is something, and, and animal welfare standards, this is something that we're trying to change in the U.S. And working together across um, uh, the ocean uh, is something that could be helpful. And this is a moment, as I've said, we don't know exactly what the political environment is. We don't know what's going to happen, but it is a moment of disruption and change where positive things could be the result. And I think that that's where, you know, the kinds of people who are focused and, and watching this presentation right now, who've been already active with petitions and letter writing and uh, getting involved on these issues with their members of Congress and their members of parliament, that's where we can all make a difference. And I think that we have a great opportunity now to do just that. Gosh, Sharon, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. That was a pretty scary list of things, actually, about what's wrong with the American food system. And, you know, we just get blasted with the stuff about chlorinated chicken. And you set out a great deal more in terms of the perils of entering Free trade agreements with America. I suspect we will return to this in a bit. But now I'd like to bring in our third speaker, Davinda Sharma, who is joining us from the Punjab. Welcome, Davinda. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, he is an award-winning English Indian journalist, writer, thinker, and researcher. Initially, he you trained as an agricultural scientist, and you hold a master's in plant breeding and genetics before becoming a journalist. And now you work in campaigns on property rights, environmental development, food security, and poverty, which is tremendously interesting to us, especially your work around fair trade and as we said I think already you're going to kick off by explaining the food riots and I gather you've had tractor riots today happening in India and why they actually connect to the whole of this conversation why what's happening in India connects to the way that world trade um, world trade happens and then I think we may pick up a little bit more about the whole way that subsidy systems distort and change the way we trade over to well, you. Thank you, Rosie. And uh, it's a pleasure to be on a panel with Orla and uh, Sharon from across the globe. And, um, you know, looking at an issue which is very important and has been uh, for several decades a, a hot issue, I would say, uh, as far as the developing countries are concerned, uh, especially at the round at the time of the ministerial conferences that the WTO has been holding uh, every two years. Uh, the reason, of course, is the rich countries' subsidies that, of course, as you said, we'll talk later. But um, ironically, what is happening in India at this particular juncture is of great importance, uh, uh, not only for the farming communities across the globe, but also for international trade. It has uh, severe implications, uh, and I think that will be very interesting to watch. Uh, for the last uh, 42 days, uh, farmers, uh, hundreds of thousands of farmers are camping outside New Delhi on the borders of New Delhi. And uh, they have been, uh, you know, uh, they have come to New Delhi uh, to basically express their concern at the, at the way the government has brought in the three central laws. Uh, it has been seven months now. The government brought in ordinance, through the, followed the ordinance route, and then uh, pushed it in the parliament. And the, we have the three laws, which basically bring in market or link up agriculture with the markets. And uh, that's the kind of a system which farmers are very, very concerned that it will uproot them or it will deny them their rightful price or it will exploit them to the hilt now. And that is something which is worrying uh, farmers, especially in the northwestern region, uh, which is Punjab and Haryana, the food bowl of the country. It began from this part of the 
of, of the country. And now, of course, the movement has spread to many parts of the of the country, like, uh, you know, south and north, uh, south and west and east also. And uh, what we are seeing is a is a iconic uh, protest happening in uh, around New Delhi. This protest is uh, amazing in the sense that the farmers have come and they have dug in their heels, and now they are saying that they already have brought their food supplies for the six next six months, and they are not going to be uh, affected by 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 things like you know where is the food going to come from them for a large number of people and they have got so much of support from the general public that it is amazing how this movement is being run you know they are they are camping in their tractor trolleys and uh, they are they are staying in a, in in uh, you know harsh winters it was 1.1 degree uh, some days back and uh, you know they are spending their nights there and yet we find they are very dedicated very cheerful the spirits are very high i also had a chance to visit uh, couple of uh, places just to see and meet farmers and uh, they, they, the, the cheerfulness was amazing after about a month of uh, camping around New Delhi. Now the point I'm trying to make is the civil society has risen in support of them. There are singers, there are army veterans, there are, there are politicians, there are of course academicians, students, uh, young people, everyone has joined the movement and it's a, it's a unique kind of uh, farmers movement that we are witnessing, the kind of which I we haven't seen anywhere in the world, uh, uh, you know, so, uh, uh, even, even till now. And this is also a lesson, uh, I think, in how how the public has uh, joined hands with the farmers. They agree that the farmers have been, uh, uh, you know, denied their rightful income all these uh, years and all these uh, decades. The farmers' protest is primarily in the zone that they, they need an assured income. They are fighting for an assured price. What they fear is that the volatility of markets the vagaries of markets have hit farmers everywhere in the world, and Punjab farmers or the Indian farmers are no exception. But there is a social security net that is available to the farmers, in at least in that green belt or the green, uh, the food bowl of the country, which was essentially the place from where green revolution started in India. And uh, they, they, this is called the minimum support price. This is a mechanism under which the, the farmer brings his produce, wheat and paddy, into the markets. You know, the government is supposed to buy. It's called open-ended procurement. The government is supposed to buy every grain that comes in at a minimum support price. If the markets are giving a higher price, fine. But when they nobody is offering them the price that the government can, uh, has announced, then the government steps in and buys, uh, or you know, the entire grain that flows into the markets. This has been the practice in Punjab and Haryana uh, primarily, and uh, this is uh, of course in some other parts of the country also. But now with the market, the new laws bringing in markets, the linkage with the markets, farmers fear that their minimum support price will go away, which uh, which means that the, the right to at least get an assured price will also disappear. And that means they will be exploited further. And uh, this this is what they are they are fighting against, and this is what they bring uh, want to bring up to the notice that this is exactly uh, a kind of a system that we don't need only for Punjab and Haryana, but we need it for across the country. The government of India normally announces a, a minimum support price for 23 crops in this country, which which covers uh, the gross crop area. We have to look into that. 80 percent of the gross crop area is covered by those 23 crops for which the prices are announced. But eventually, it's only effective for wheat and paddy, the two predominant. Um, you know crops and uh, this is because the rest of the crops is just on paper it becomes a kind of a you know and you, you get an idea as to what should be the normal price for the crops but nothing beyond that the farmers now say that they, they want this to be made a legal right minimum support price should become a legal right for farmers which means nothing will be traded in the country below that price this is what the farmers are demanding and this of course will mean more money into the hands of farmers more income in the hands of farmers this of course has implications for the economy the way economy will be boosted and so on but more importantly i think is is the connection that links up international trade with with the kind of agitation that is happening in punjab i think uh, uh, happening around new delhi i think what is important to understand is that uh, this particular movement has a, has implications for farmers all over the world. You know, whether it is America, whether it is Canada, whether it is Australia or, or Europe and so on, you know, farmers everywhere are hit by the volatility of markets. And this is what has destroyed livelihoods. We have seen small farmers getting out of agriculture, uh, you know, over the decades and, you know, whether it is Europe or whether it is America and so on. In India, uh, you know, we need to understand that uh, roughly 50% of the population is engaged with agriculture, which means uh, if, you, wow. if you were to 
include their families, 600 million people are involved with agriculture. And their, their future or their future livelihood depends upon the, you know, the social security net that the government uh, can provide. And if left to markets, they, they fear that the majority will have to quit agriculture. You know, this is evident from the, the, the countries that where we have borrowed the model from. You know, it has come from America and Europe. And uh, in, in America, it has been six, seven decades since they had the open market reforms in agriculture. And uh, in at Richard Nixon's uh, time, the agriculture secretary, the then agriculture secretary had made that infamous statement, get big or get out. And this is what the International Food Policy Research Institute in Washington, D.C. is now suggesting to India, move up or move out. So I think it is very clear that the farmers are aware of that, that the basic idea is to push them out of agriculture. And which means uh, in, uh, in the absence of, uh, you know, alternate job creation or availability of employment opportunities, the farmers know that they're going to be hit, uh, you know, more severely than what they have faced uh, in all these uh, decades. Now, having said that, uh, uh, the important part would be that uh, farmers in Europe, America, they are all, 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 uh, you know, uh, affected by by the, the, the denial of an assured income, uh, and that is what I think they would be all looking forward to. So once India sets up a mechanism, if at all the farmers succeed, if it, if they, if at all they are able to set up a mechanism providing a minimum uh, support price or what is called a minimum floor price or a guaranteed price for for the crops, I think the farmers in the rest of the world would also be looking forward to it how to how to see that they can also be benefiting from the same kind of a, a design or a model that india has created i'm already you know getting hundreds of requests from farmers across the globe and they're asking me you know what is happening in india what is this minimum price sir? we also want the if it can if, if it can be done in india we also would like to learn from it and see that you know we also uh, can take advantage of the minimum price because that is where you know farmers everywhere as i said suffer and I remember one farmer telling me recently, calling me from America, he says, uh, you know, what people don't understand is that uh, living in debt all through your life is living in hell. And we also want to get out of that uh, situation. And I think the Indian farmers are providing us an, a clear picture or a clear opportunity now that there is a, there is an option and this, that's something we can try for. I think that is the kind of a message which goes internationally. The other part is what will happen to international trade. I think that is very fascinating. It will be very interesting to see what happens because only yesterday the, there is an Indian trade review going on in the WTO and the United States has, uh, has conveyed a message to India very clearly that you need to remove uh, the support that you give for crops, which means the kind of minimum support price that India gives to for wheat and rice, uh, which is according to the WTO language, uh, for those of us who don't understand much of trade issues, there is a, a, a for the developing countries a provision that you can provide 10% of the total value of one product as subsidy support, which means as a minimum support price. You know, so that uh, the, the Americans have always been telling us, the American plus Europe has always been telling us that India exceeds that limit uh, and uh, 10 percent we are getting we're giving already 60 to 70 percent although india is challenging that that's a different issue but the point here is that on one hand the rich countries are telling us uh, to do away with the minimum support price or to do away with that safety net on the other hand indian farmers are wanting that 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 particular safety net or kind of support that they get should be expanded to cover the all the crops for which the minimum support price is announced um, uh, in India. So I think this is going to be, uh, if at all they succeed, then I think first would be what will happen to the WTO trade negotiations, especially in this context where it is already a hot issue, as you know, for the last several years, the, the, the effort is to uh, uh, ask India to dismantle the public stock holding. You know, uh, India, India uh, buys uh, grain from the farmers in, in the sense or in, uh, by saying or by justifying saying that you need to provide uh, food, a uh, cheaper food to, to 200 million people who are malnourished or who are living in hunger. So therefore, it is important. But over the last few years, there has been a push on India to, to do away with the public stock holding, which means okay. you can't buy, buy uh, food uh, you know, or grain from the farmers at that subsidized price. Let the markets uh, dictate the price. That has been the argument. So the entire negotiation would have to be re-looked and this is what is going to be the major disruptions for international trade and what will it mean mean for the and the subsidy structure the world is faced with or the subsidy issue that has been uh, okay. as i said uh,
very hot issue. I think it would be another aspect that needs to be seen uh, where we are going to head. But uh, you know, Indian farmers believe that um, the, the government has been under pressure from the WTO as well as from the World Bank, which has been wanting agriculture to be linked with uh, linked internationally and internationally we have seen there are lessons which i think being oh, everyone needs to look into it when in 2007 the world had the food crisis you know uh, major food crisis there were uh, food riots in 37 countries but india yes. escaped because indian agriculture was not linked internationally okay. and uh, for a country like India, I think, and that's a message for the rest of the world also, that, uh, you know, the emphasis should be on self-sufficiency. The, the emphasis right. should be on feeding your own population. As, uh, as Gandhi had once said, Mahatma Gandhi, you know, he said, uh, what the world needs is production by the masses, not production for masses. I think right. that's a one uh, lesson for international trade uh, uh, also to, to be sure that we cannot destroy farming populations, uh, you know, just because there is enough food in the world. And that can yeah. be, of course, created in a manner that the... Uh, can, I, can, I, can I come in now to bring in um, our other two speakers? That was absolutely fantastic. Um, that raises so many issues. I mean, I'm going to come straight back to you, Ola, because obviously, let's, let's just stick slightly with the subsidy system. Which of course, um, we have just left the common agricultural policy, which was a giant subsidy system. What does it mean for us now to be uh, without that subsidy? Uh, I mean, that's a great question, isn't it? And I think th those are things that are under discussion um, like currently. And there's obviously big debates between what uh, those subsidies might look like in the short term versus the long term. And I know that um, there's a, the SFI system, I think, which is supposed to ladder up towards ELMS, the, the um, Environmental Land Management System. Um, and there's there's debates over whether it's a good idea to put something in between or whether that makes it less likely to to be able to achieve long term goals. So, I mean, the, anybody who thought that leaving the EU or you know Brexiting was going to uh, bring an end to these big discussions um, or really it was a bit misguided. We've got really big, you know, chunky bits of policy making to do. Yes. And there are big questions over how we manage our land and the the, the um, balance between you know uh, managing the land for nature and um, the ecology and uh, the recovery and climate versus food production and those are big questions that we all need to um, to engage with and um, I'm going to take the opportunity to plug uh, a session by my colleague Vicky Hurd who is the expert in all things um, environmental land management and she's doing a session on this on the 13th. So um, there'll be a lot of engagement and discussion there. And I think anybody who wants more detail on that can um, sign up for Vicky's newsletters and also go to her session on the 13th. She will definitely be able to answer all your questions. Um, Sharon, do you think it's realistic for farmers around the world? Because obviously if India, if the Indian farmers succeed in this, it sets up an extraordinary precedent given just how many there were. With Devinder saying there's 50% of the population. Do you think it's realistic? Well, I mean, I think what we need to remember right now that, you know, there's huge subsidies that go, whether it's through the cap, through some new system that the UK devises or in the US, um, there's huge subsidies that go to farmers already uh, in countries like the US that complain about subsidies that are being proposed or, or you know, in, in effect in India and other countries. So what are they subsidizing? That's the question. I mean, it's been focused very much on this sort of industrial model. And you look at the pandemic and, and, and Trump's trade wars where they've been pumping out money to some of the largest agribusinesses while small, smaller dairy operations are going under at a rate that um, you know, continues um, to be unsustainable and, and unfair. The same time that the US is negotiating an agreement with Canada um, that you know, it just um, entered into um, in, in 2019, in 2020, um, where it focused on saying, well, you know, the Canadian government is unfairly subsidizing dairy in Canada by having a supply management system, which is, you know, it's a different version of a way to 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 uh, make these smaller um, farm operations sustainable. And yet, in the United States, there's dairy farms that are saying, we would like to have that same system. Why are we going out? you know, to Canada and trying to unravel a system that we should be copying. So these trade agreements, which are designed to supposedly level the tra 
playing field in ways, often operate in ways that basically benefit the largest um, corporate agriculture that's multinational, that has its hands all over the world. Um, and that and the other folks aren't really at the table. I mean, we, we talked about oversight of uh, trade agreements and um, the role of Congress. Uh, the U.S. certainly has an extremely um, secretive and non-transparent trade negotiation process, but the people that are at the table are, you know, five to six hundred corporate advisors that have a preferred access to be able to talk to the U.S. trade representative and look at tax, and they actually propose tax that gets taken wholesale and put into these trade agreements, which very much is a deregulatory um, kind of, um, you know, model. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we really look need to look at the trade system as well as our agricultural system and say, you know, wh what are the signals we want to give? What are the kinds of of agriculture that we want to promote. And some of the things that you've been talking about in the UK um, and certainly in India as well, those are examples. Um, uh, just to give one more example on this, you know, the US went after India and said, you're subsidizing your solar uh, industry too much and get rid of those subsidies. Um, which actually undercut in the U.S. being able to have less expensive solar operations to be more renewable and more climate friendly. Well, then, of course, India turned around with a bunch of other countries and sued the United States and says, well, you're doing the same thing because you're trying to promote local economies. That's not a bad thing, promoting local economies and having jobs locally and moving towards renewable energy. So we have trade rules under the WTO as well as in these free trade agreements, which really undermine global goals that we want to promote like climate change. And I think the time is now to be, you know, while, while the WTO is, you know, not functioning very well, while the US is at a place of uh, maximum potential change, while the UK as well is mm -hmm. adopting its own trade policies and its own um, future, uh, standards for everything from environment to agriculture to, to potentially chemical policies. This is the moment that we could really look at trade rules and say, these have to change and we have to have, they should be guided by our global goals here, which should be that farming is sustainable and should be that we have, you know, uh, climate friendly and, you know, we're not, we're addressing climate change instead of in the U.S. right now, this trade promotion authority I mentioned specifically says that the, the trade agreements the U.S. enters into cannot try to address climate change. So these are things, and that's up for renewal uh, in a couple of months. So these are opportunities where we can change those directives and, and what the goals are, and maybe have more of a global conversation about how we should be doing things differently in the future. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's really scary to say you can't do things that work with climate change. But Devinda, do you think that, um, do you think that this will happen? I mean, do you think the farmers will win? Well, that's a very difficult question. We are all keeping our fingers uh, crossed and uh, the farmers are not relenting. The government is not giving up. There is a kind of a stalemate uh, deadlock happening and they already have had uh, seven rounds of a uh, discussion. Another round of discussion is uh, supposed to have be ha st supposed to be happening tomorrow and we will see what comes out of it. But uh, what we see, the kind of fervor that we see across the country is that the farmers are, uh, are clear. They are maintaining that, you know, we are not going to go back till the till the laws are repealed. And uh, that's a big issue, as you, you will all appreciate or understand. And they are saying we are even willing to stay, uh, you know, for another another three years. They are saying that we are willing to stay till 2024, the, the time when the next elections are to be held. So I think that tells you that uh, the determination that farmers have, that they are not going to get anything less than a repeal of the laws. Why? Because this, if the, the, I think the, what is important important to understand is that we are bringing in the same kind of agriculture that has actually done a lot of damage to environment, mm -hmm. to, to sustainability and so on, and also to farmers across the globe. Now, when you bring in those laws in India, I think farmers in India are, are, are very alert on this particular issue. They have followed the WTO negotiations very carefully all these years. In fact, one of the studies that I use is from the IATP. You know how, how the, the, the study that IATP has shown that uh, when you, when you, you you have dumping prices, uh, you know, which determine the international prices. And those dumping prices, let's say in the case of wheat is 38% is what the dumping price is. And which means, you know, the farmer in India is uh, going to be unnecessarily, you know, facing that brunt because when we say, oh, 
the global you have to be competitive to the global markets and global exports then you know the the it is a subsidies which is, which uh, make the prices uh, you know uh, become competitive and i think that is where we need to really relook at this entire issue there is a st another study by untad india which says that if we were to withdraw the green box subsidies uh, in wto which means in wto language the non trade starting subsidies then the agriculture exports from america europe and uh, and canada would fall by 40% so look at the competitiveness of agriculture sports and it will hit the farmers in india it will hit the farmers in africa yeah. and we know the famous case of uh, uh, cotton subsidies and when they when the four heads of state from the western african countries had written that article in new york times saying your subsidies kill our farmers and yeah. that is some which we haven't yet woken up to in the sense that uh, the, the, this uh, Im negative impact has been reduced to a level. Even in the latest figures that we have is in 2018, the OECD provided a subsidy support of $246 billion for agriculture. And look at Europe. Europe provides a subsidy support of about $100 billion, mm -hmm. uh, half of it as direct income support under the common agriculture policy. Now, all this has implication for developing country farmers. And I think we need to sort out or we need to take a re-look at this way the subsidies are structured and the way the subsidies are, uh, you know, explicit or implicit. Yeah. Both are covered and protected. I think the developing countries' uh, farmers' livelihoods depend a lot on the subsidies that the rich countries provide to their agriculture. Okay, thank you so much for this. Um, the time is racing on, so I'm going to bring in some, uh, we've got many questions from the audience. Um, all a question here from Hazel, and I think other people have asked similar questions. Can you touch on how international trade agreements affect food security and ecology in low-income countries abroad, e.g. sub-Saharan Africa? It seems like a huge opportunity to start addressing global justice. Is there any movement on this, as well as the domestic concerns around safety and UK sustainability? And maybe you could also, at this point, touch a little bit on what you feel about the question of self-sufficiency. It's something that I always find very difficult to answer. You're muted. Mm -hmm. Sorry, okay. I was a uh, yeah, classic fail there. Um, well, if you find it difficult to answer, uh, Rosie, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to step into that breach. But let me see, I'm going to do my best. I mean, one thing I would say is the UK, uh, in terms of food security and, and, you know, relationship with low income countries, I think the UK already pays, um, you know, an ever decreasing amount for its food in terms of its percentage of, you know, of, of income. And, um one of the benefits, supposed benefits of, of Brexit was supposed to be cheap food. Um, now, Sustain is like really clear on its opposition to the idea, the notion of cheap food, um, uh, but, but they still keep banging that drum. And uh, it's upsetting for all sorts of reasons. One is it does, it, to me anyway, harks back to a very Im imperialist mindset, essentially, that the, you know, the UK is the centre and uh, you know, will, will ask its partner nations to send it cheap food, um, which uh, you know, I would reject utterly as a notion um, to start with. That's the first thing. And we do have a briefing on our site actually about our oppositions to cheap food. And we did ask our partners who work in, in um, the poverty organizations to join us in that because um, there's somehow this, this idea that um, you can solve food poverty with, with or poverty in general. Um, with cheap food and that is not the case so just to make that clear so that's the first thing about cheap food um can we start to address global justice well i mean i suppose that's the next step isn't it if we're paying the proper price for our food um, and and everything is built into it then the people who are producing the food have got more chance of having a better livelihood and that obviously includes um, partner nations in the, the global south if we're asking people to send us cheap food somebody somewhere is losing out and it's probably the producer um, so is there any movement on this? Well, yes. I mean, Sustain has been kind of trying to make this argument now for a number of years as part of all of the, the, the Brexit discussion. We've, we have utterly rejected the idea of cheap food um, and we've been trying to raise the implications of it. The latest one was um, last year as part of the Ag Bill, the idea that we couldn't have high standards. Uh, we couldn't insist on high standards in trade because um, it would hurt global South nations who wanted to trade with us, which again, you know, it's sort of breathtaking in its um, offensiveness, actually, the idea that um, because a nation is in the global South that it can't possibly produce to high standards, you know, we just, again, utterly reject that notion. There's plenty of 
um, global five nations who already produce to high standards. And in fact, there's plenty of examples as well that have been provided to us by partner organizations of um, nations doing very well, global south nations, you know, opting for higher standards and doing well, both in terms of creating new markets, but also improving conditions at home. So, you know, if high standards are good for us. And we all seem to agree that here in the UK, we want high standards. Then the same kind of arguments about having high standards apply to um, producer nations as well. Both First World and Sharon and I produced a paper on that, um, but also um, global south nations. So, um we are involved, we are making the case for it, and we will continue to do so. But um, maybe Devinder um, might come in as well about this. I'm sure he'll be able to speak yeah. more. Okay, no, I will come back to it. But I'd also just like to now bring Sharon in on a specific question for both Devinder and Sharon from Vicky Hurd, who is the Sustain Head of Farming. Mm -hmm. um, how can we best work with groups to influence the Indian government and the US Department response to the UK government's unhelpful deregulating stance, which it plays out in its trade deals and its policy? Sharon. Well, I mean, as I've, you know, maybe people are, are pretty aware, I think, that our new vice president is actually of Indian descent, and maybe she'll take an interest in actually thinking about bringing these issues. You know, we, we have people in the U.S. now really, really engaged in these elections, in part because now we have an administration that looks a lot more like America, uh, both at the top level and at the people that are being uh, nominated for the cabinet. It's very diverse, and I think that it may bring a different perspective um, to uh, discussions about where we go forward and, and what the role of the United States is in the world. Certainly the U.S., whether it's bullying the U.K. around food standards or bullying India around subsidies or, you know, it's also bullying Kenya right now saying that, you know, the plastics, uh, plastic bag bans are, are uh, illegal under trade law. You know, this is behavior that is is you know, really bad. And I think that uh, we need to focus within Congress as well as out in civil society and thinking not so much this whole, you know, make America great again, you know, nationalist kind of America is the greatest in the world and everybody else is, you know, nothing. And really think about having a global role that's positive and that works collaboratively with the rest of the world. And, and certainly the pandemic is one example of where um, we ought to be um, doing that instead of withdrawing from agreements or not participating in agreements that provide for vaccines around the world at an affordable price. Certainly climate change is an example where the U.S. could get back in um, with the Paris Accord. And I think this is, you know, really Biden's best instincts. You know, his, his our experience with him on trade issues hasn't been so great in the past, but he certainly wants to do right when it comes to the U.S. role in the global, um, you know, in, in, in global setting, uh, what happens globally in a, in a positive way. And I think that leading into those better instincts and the fact that the, his cabinet uh, and Congress now um, is much more diverse, I think we have the potential to have more of a, a moral uh, uh, approach and moral and ethical approach to, to how we go forward in the future. I mean, I'm hoping so. You know, we don't know, but it's the, the beginning of a new period, and, and I think it's important to be optimistic uh, and, and gather your forces um, of civil society as well to, to support those best instincts that, that are coming out right now. And Devinda, what do you think about the, that basic question about what, what, uh, what India can, you know, how we can engage and take this forward? Well, I think there are two ways of uh, helping this out. And uh, one is, of course, the civil society should should make a pressure or uh, put pressure within their own countries uh, to see that the that the standards or the norms that are being specified or the or the kind of um, you know position that the countries are taking needs to be relaxed as, uh, or seen in the context of what damage it will do to the developing countries or where the exports are going to come from or going to finally go to. That is one thing. Then the second part is that we also need to 
collaborate uh, and that of course has been happening um, among disabled society groups which helps us also to prepare ourselves uh, getting some kind of a solid information always helps us in building up pressure within the country now why i'm saying this is you know many times when the exports happen you know it may suit the interest of one country but often you know it is said that the standards that we talk about you know uh, we have to uh, developing countries are being asked to meet the high standards being laid out but often what is missed out is the kind of ex agriculture exports that come from the rich countries are also below standards it's very interesting yes. and uh, you find it fascinating that you know although yes. we are made, have told that you know you must improve your standards but what you export to us by and large has been below standards and if the developing countries were to actually come up to that or impose those standards at the time of imports much of the exports that the rich countries are sending it to developing countries would be would be stopped and restricted i can give you a couple of examples yes. to illustrate I mean, you know, because um, uh, some years back, milk came to India from Denmark, although India is the biggest producer of milk. And I, I, I know at that time the questions were raised that, you know, if we were to use our safety parameters or our standards, you know, this milk uh, imports could have been rejected. You know, I also know the case when India imports wheat from Australia, the Americans were upset. And the Americans were upset and they said, our wheat is of better quality than, than, than Australia, so why are you not taking our wheat? And then I, I remember the, at that time, the Agriculture Minister of India had told them that your wheat has a disease called powdery mildew, and that is what we don't want in India. Now, the point here is these are things, ticklish issues, but sanitary and phytosanitary measures and so on, which we need to understand, need to see that it's not always what, what they say as a good quality or coming from rich countries is, is, is definitely of their standard. You know, some years back, it was very, very fascinating for me to to get to get this or, or understand this, and then of course talk about it. You know, America exports its uh, apples, the Washington apples, and uh, these Washington apples, according to the uh, uh, to Cabby in UK, you know, the institute had done a study where it said it comes with 106 pests and diseases. Imagine if the the Washington apple. I don't know how many now, but some years back it it, it was with that kind of a pest load that it was coming into our countries. If we had imposed, I'm sure if, we, if these developing countries had sent back the shipment, America would have rejected uh, those apples. The the point I'm trying to make is you can't have double standards. You know, uh, ask the rich countries, uh, ask the poor countries or the developing countries, least developed countries to raise their standards to to meet your requirement. But at the same time, uh, what is sent to us in the developing world is also of uh, of low quality or not uh, it is required for instance now the the americans have won the case against india on chicken legs and uh, we are we are going to be inundated uh, soon you know we, we we held on to the ex import so far by saying that you know there, there are there are hormones injections and so on and so forth but now it has been uh, the ruling against us so we'll have to import uh, chicken legs and once you start importing chicken legs you know the chicken industry of india will suffer which means millions of livelihoods will be destroyed i think we need to understand how these um, these subsidies or these kinds of uh, mm -hmm. uh, standards that we lay out undermine uh, the the the, the econo economics as far as the rural india is concerned or oh. the agriculture sector is concerned. So I think there is an interesting uh, uh, way to look into these kinds of um, uh, contentious issues and then try to understand how, how the, you know, it's not only one part of the world which is inefficient or, uh, you know, not be meet the standards, but the other part of the world is no better. That's the point yeah. I'd like to make. Thank you, Devinder. That's really interesting. I didn't know anything about the fact that you had to import chicken legs. That's just awful. And that it's putting people out of work. Now, I'm afraid we're up against time, but we will move over to Zoom. And I hope very much that we can take the questions that are in the chat box with us. I'm not sure how that can happen, but maybe it can. But before we leave the session, I'd just like to go around all the panel and just ask them, you know, what are the things that we can do as consumers? I mean, as we said, every time you buy something, you are effectively trading. What would be your top things for people to do to get themselves involved in this debate? Ola. Unmute. Sorry. I'm muting myself. Um, okay, so um, I'm, because I'm representing Sustain, I'm going to start with buy a veg box and buy okay. some fish, or if you're buying meat back from a, a local producer, um, you know, if we're going to support farmers, then we should uh, we should definitely be um, trying for aiming for shorter supply chains and uh, and supporting our local producers. Um, I've got some specific ones. Anybody who's interested in this, please sign up for the Sustain newsletters. We will let you know when there's specific actions coming up around the trade bill for example and we'll help you write to your mp although you don't need our help to do that do that anytime you like 
Um, but do, you know, write to your local paper as well, get people engaged that way. And while you're at it, buy one, because we all need our local and regional papers. They're holding our politicians to account and they need your help. Um, and sign up for other sustained sessions, Friday the 8th on climate, Tuesday the 12th on supply chains, and Wednesday the 13th on foreign policy elms. I'm out. Fantastic. I want to thank you very much, Sharon. Okay, well, I can't really add to that. We have one minute to go. So I would say shop locally, support your local farmers, but also get on the phone to your representatives of your government and write your letters to the editor, which are the most read part of the newspaper where I live, uh, along with obituaries. Uh, and that, because it can't just be about your local buying habits, it has to be also about communicating yeah. with others and making sure that you get together with other people to, to push change going forward. And Tavinda. Well, I will agree with my co-panelists that uh, the first and foremost is that the consumer should demand, uh, you know, that local food, what we grow locally, uh, as as uh, the uh, requirement for for all kinds of foods that we have. Second is to get away from this fad of superfoods. You know, the superfoods that get transported from across the world, and we eventually find there are better superfoods, uh, you know, which nature provides us in our own backyards. We refuse to see that. We go by 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 the PR exercise or whatever, and we end up buying those foods. And we know many of them have uh, turned out to be you know failure after a few years and so on so these two things I, I think are very important and finally i think the study which sustain had done several years back the food miles report is very very important people need to be educated that you know uh, there is no use uh, buying apples which coming all the way from uh, from from chile or from Fuji into India. I don't see what, what is the justification of apples traveling across the world. Uh, you know, this is insane trade. And I think this insane trade must stop. You know, we have a huge in apple industry within the country and we are importing apples from 44 countries. I don't know why. So I think we need to educate people, consumers, that what you need is to buy what is locally produced. And don't go for these fats of superfoods. You have superfoods in your own backyard, which probably you have ignored all these years. It's time to pick up them, learn from that. And that's the kind of a, a agriculture model, sustainable, ecologically viable, and also environmentally suitable for all of us. Thank you very, very much. And thank you very much to Orla and Sharon and Vinda. I hope that that has given you a small window into this unbelievably complicated situation but that you can see the fact that Davinda has 44 apples and that they're going to get chicken legs that these things are so connected the whole world has got trade deals and things that move and affect how we live how we buy how healthy we are and how healthy our planet is so make them simple shop locally take your actions, write your MPs. As Ola has been saying, this is a time of change and opportunity. And we do have the climate talks in the at the end of the year in Glasgow. So there's a lot of pressure on the governments now to start changing and you know, people accept that we can't make our climate targets, we don't change our food system. And the, the joy of all that is that those two things together head in the same direction. What's good for one is good for the other and is good for all of us. And on that note, thank you very much. We will now flip over to Zoom, I hope, and see whoever there with the questions that, as I say, very sorry we didn't get to, but thank you for being such a great and engaged audience. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>